Welcome to the Desert Sanctuary with Carl and Laura Forehand. Often when we have doubts about religion or simply want to ask questions, it can feel like we are wandering out into the desert. We would like to invite you to join our sanctuary, the Desert Sanctuary. We've tried to pick guests that would resonate with and challenge us and our fellow seekers here in the desert. We believe that a key to the journey is to keep asking good questions, and we believe that all stories are sacred. Our hope is that you will find life and healing for your body and mind, and that you will be able to be where you are and be who you are. And now, here is our show. Hi, welcome to the Desert Sanctuary Podcast. I'm Laura Forehand. It's been a while since I've said that. I know. So We got ahead of ourselves for a I, while. I know. So anyway, um, I'm Laura Forehand. I'm here with Carl Forehand, and we have a really exciting guest today. I don't know if you want me to dive right into the bio or you have anything to share. Yeah, we've, we've done about 300 interviews and this this one's, <laughs> I'm nervous, not today. Because... <laughs> we have a full-fledged celebrity in the yeah, house, right? right? Oh, here. no. I, I think only if you happened to be a youth group kid between the ages of like 16 to you know, 18, like maybe, but not yeah. enough. <laughs> Amy Grant's in the house. Yeah, award-winning yeah. and billboard charting artist Flamey Grant is a shame slaying hip swaying singing songwriting drag queen from Western North Carolina. Her 2022 debut out or excuse me record the Bible Belt Baby reached the number one spot on the iTunes Christian charts. The first drag queen performer to achieve this feat and was nominated for best pop album at the San Diego music awards and was named one of the top 10 queer country albums of 2023 by rainbow rodeo magazine. Her single good day also debuted at number 20 on the billboard Christian digital sales chart. Flamey is a winning winner of the 2023 Kerrville Folk Festival, New Folk Competition, and a 2023 Queer X Award nominee for Best Drag Artist and has been featured in Rolling Stone, Entertainment Weekly, People, and more. Her music has over 750,000 streams on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon Music. A powerhouse vocalist and intrepid songwriter, who blends folk, gospel, and roots. Flamey drags you into a therapeutic, theatrical mix of storytelling and song. Welcome so much to the podcast, Flamey Grant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for that. And reading the whole bio, y'all got every detail. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm honored honored to be here. Yeah. So we, we believe stories are sacred. We've interviewed about 300 people. A lot of them were survivor stories, and um, we also, you know, have come around. And we had a we had a a Pride Month in November <laughs> on our podcast, but we want to do it in the actual Pride Month. We're going to go to a a um, parade. Parade, yeah, yes. And um, we'll talk about maybe talk about that a little bit later. But we think stories are sacred, and so we wanted you to tell some of your story or whatever portion of it you want to, and just get us rolling here. And then we'll mm. kind of dive yeah. in and ask whenever. Awesome. Well, um, 300 is a lot of stories y'all have listened to. So I will, uh, I'll try to tell the, tell the best parts of mine. <laughs> um, I, I love that you, you know, you talk about survivors. Um, I think that any, any queer kid who grows up in America it has a survival story. And I think especially if you happen to be a queer kid who grows up in the Bible Belt or in the South, uh, and, and maybe even more so if you happen to be a queer kid who who grows up and uh, likes to dress in your mom's clothes <laughs> as, as a kid. Um, that's where uh, I, I would say that that was my first uh, encounter with drag was stomping around in my mom's heels. And um, we have, you know, family photos in the album to to prove it. Um, which is interesting because that th- that those photos were kind of taken and kept because obviously there was a moment there at the beginning when it you know the the family thought it was cute or, or adorable or or whatever and yeah. then um, I remember uh, times uh, especially really early on uh, one one time getting into my mom's lipstick and kind of ruining a tube of her lipstick uh, remember uh, you know the 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 pressure I felt 
to not do those things. It, it, it came on pretty strong pretty early. I think there was probably a, a, rec- a flash of recognition among my, my parents of what was happening with me and, and maybe that this thing wasn't a, it wasn't a one-time deal for me to walk out into the living room clumping around in my mom's heels. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so real quickly, I, I got uh, uh, ushered, <laughs> uh, is a gentle way to put it, uh, into uh, conformity, you know, c- conformity with what masculine standards were in that community Mm -hmm. and um and masculinity is really important in uh, the community i was raised in the church i went to is called plymouth brethren and it's very much uh on the the far fundamentalist end of of evangelicalism that the the spectrum there um Mm -hmm. and very patriarchal you know women in that church still my mom my mom still attends that church and she covers her hair uh, you know, based on whatever that Second Corinthians mm-hmm. throw away, throw away verses about the yeah. woman woman's hair being yeah. the glo- her glory, uh, mm-hmm. can't compete with God's glory. So you got to cover that shit up. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, so women didn't speak, uh, and men were expected to. And I w- that's how I was raised. I was raised to be a leader in our our church, and it was always a really hard um, thing for me to. I, I never felt like I belonged in that particular role in our church. Um, I love to sing and I, and I would, I would, I would get up and do, you know, we call it special music. And, sure. <laughs> um, yeah. and so church was the first place I found my, my singing voice for sure. And it's the first place I started writing songs. I wrote my first song when I was nine and it was a song called Lord, your love. And it was, you know, just the cheesiest little cute worship song you could imagine a nine-year-old writing. Um, and, uh, but I never, I never, I always felt uncomfortable with the role of, uh, stepping into the role of what the other men in the church would do, which was just to, you know, lead hymns, uh, you know, call, stand up during the church service and call out a hymn, uh, stand up and pray, stand up and, uh, you know, do, do whatever. Our church was very, it's kind of Quakerish that way. Like the, yeah. the men would just take turns. There was no, no paid leadership, no staff, nothing like that. It was just, if you had a, uh, if you, if you had a certain set of genitalia, you were good to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that just never it never worked for me and i actually I never not not one time in my 18 years of going to that church did i actually stand up during the service and perform that role much to the disappointment of of my my grandfather in particular who's kind of the pillar of of our community mm-hmm. i wasn't a pk i wasn't a, pa- a pastor's kid because we didn't have pastors but if we had a, 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 you know my papa would have been that person in our community. So I, I, I identify with the PK community. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, it was, it was a really long, slow extrication from that world for me. Um, I, uh, I was, they, they did a really good job with the indoctrination and, and I, I bought in hook, line and sinker for a long time and, and genuine, genuinely believed the message that, the life ahead for me, if I were to ever come out as queer, if I were to ever leave the fold, you know, become that black sheep, that the life ahead for me would be one of struggle and pain and despair. And I believed that. And so I did everything I could to conform, fit in, to, to, to try and belong uh, to that world, which included, you know, going to a Christian college and, and, and working in church and, um, you know, just trying to trying to maintain my, my status there. A big part of which was obviously not being gay. That was, uh, you know, the the unspoken um, uh, social taboo, like like the the ultimate sin, right? Abortion and and, and homosexuality were kind of just ranked high up there in the evangelical world. And you know, I knew from a pretty early age. I would say fourth grade, third or fourth grade. I was aware that I was queer. I didn't have the language for it. I didn't know. I didn't know what the words were, but I knew something was up. And um, so I worked for years and years to hide that. I even self enrolled in Exodus, which is you know conversion therapy. That that organization is no longer around, thankfully, because the founders uh, <laughs> admitted that 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 it hadn't worked for them <laughs> and they, yeah, and they right. had been, they, they had been selling a lie to, to thousands of families and kids for years and years. Um, but I, I self-enrolled in that program for five years, attended therapy, group therapy, private therapy. Um, and, you know, even when I got my first church job, I went to the pastors and I was like, before y'all hire me, you need to know that I struggle. I struggle with same sex attraction. That's how we used to have to talk about it. Couldn't say I'm gay. Um, 
And, 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 you know, they assigned me an accountability partner on staff. So another pastor checked in with me every week and, you know, it was, I was very committed, deeply, deeply committed and sincere in my conviction, um, that that was the path that was the right path for me. It's what God wanted for me. And I wanted to please God and I wanted to please my community. And yeah. so I did for years. Alex, can I ask and, you interrupt you and ask you? Yeah, that? please. What does that feel like? I know because I, I was going to ask the same question because man, I'm just, I'm feeling like I'm feeling something right now while you're talking about it, like just this really heaviness. And how do you, how do you like live this dual life? Really? I mean, to and, always and what I, what I am really is wrong. Yeah. You know, that I'm somehow uh, deficient or I don't measure up. Is there, is there shame in that? Or, oh, deeply. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And isn't that the story? Isn't that the story of evangelicalism, though? Right. You know, we're 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 born into the world a sinner. We uh, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and we reap the consequences. And, and that is the uh, inheritance of every human. And and it's you know supposedly scripturally based, and it's drilled into us from the get go. And and so uh, every evangelical, I think, grows up with some level of shame for for who we are for just being right. for literally just being period and and uh because we're born we're fallen because we're here we're sinful um we're we're depraved we're unworthy and thank goodness there was this god sacrificed god's son in order to you know appease god like the weird math of of atonement sub penal substitutionary atonement um thank goodness for that because otherwise we'd be up shit Creek and, and, yeah. and have, have no rescue. And um, so, yeah, there's so much shame. And, 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 and I think, you know, a special shame associated with queerness, because even though we would quote verses like for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, uh, that we still ranked it, you know, that it was an unspoken ranking, like <laughs> lying was not as bad as being gay, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so, um, so yeah, there was there was a, a deep shame because I couldn't tell anybody. No one knew for years and years what was going on internally with me. And it, it and it you had it right with the dual life. It was too it it, it was you know, I was Spider Man, uh or I, Superman. I don't I don't really know comics all that well. <laughs> Whichever one has to hide their their public yeah, persona yeah, from their right. from their uh, their identity. Yeah. Uh, uh and um so it it it, it it's exhausting, it's tedious, it's um it takes all of your energy, and and I, and I think that this is true for a lot of queer folks that it it um we're stunted in in some ways. Our our growth is slowed, our development slowed, our mm -hmm. mental emotional capacity is all slowed because so much of our energy goes to uh, maintaining this facade, right. and uh, and and it is it's it's deeply depressing and sad and hard and that is why and i don't want to dwell on this stuff for too long because uh, i i like to talk about the queer joy side of things but but this this is the reality that uh, it's why we have higher rates of self-harm and suicide among lgbtq youth it's why we have higher rates of homelessness among lgbtq youth um we we uh we look at the world and, and the world we're presented with and um we don't see an example of a healthy, happy, whole, queer, Christian life presented to us. In fact, we're told the opposite, right? We're told that the only option that awaits down that path is despair and darkness and solitude and isolation and, yeah. and sickness, right. um, all, all of it. Um, and so where there is no vision, the people perish, right? Like <laughs> that is a true, true, th there's, I don't know anything more true than that. If you can't see yourself represented, if you can't see that happy, hopeful future, it's really hard to envision and to imagine yourself. Um, and thankfully, some do. Thankfully, some of us uh, ha have that capacity or, or something intervenes, something comes into our world that gives us that hope. Um, but for a lot, that's not the case. For so many, so many don't make it. And that's why I think a queer story is a survival story, especially a queer story in America, especially a queer story in the South mm -hmm. is a survival story. Because if you made it through that, baby, you are a survivor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the, 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 the small things, the small interventions I had in my life that, that enabled me to slowly crawl my way out of that cesspool of, of, of self hate and, and self-loathing and, um, belief that god you know couldn't love me except for this little loophole of, of jesus sacrifice and mm -hmm. um <clears throat> yeah uh, uh 
it, it it's uh <laughs> that's that's a hard part of the story but it is it's where the story starts for so many right. exactly. so what were what were some of those things that helped pull you out of that um that shame i like to call it a shame spiral and i i think we've all been in it but for different reasons and you know being in the evangelical world for so long i mean i have my issues with shame as well um but mm -hmm. what helped you because you said there were people that intervened or I don't, I don't know if you said people, but what it, what was your intervention? If you can speak to that a little bit. Before you yeah. it, I like that word stunted because mm. trauma does that to us. Yeah. It kind of mm. keeps us back there in that mm -hmm. place. But I am, I'm as anxious as well to hear that part yeah. of how you began to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, the answer is queer people, you know, other queer people saved me uh, from literally Ellen Degenerous, yeah. you know, coming out, coming out in the '90s on her sitcom, which I secretly taped uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, we, you know, we we went to prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, and so I had to set the VCR with the little, uh, you know, digital code to like turn it on, uh, turn it on and off the recording uh, on a VHS tape um, secretly. And then the next time I was home alone, I watched it, um, and so the, so I distinctly remember. Oh, I'll never forget the, watching Ellen like say those words. Into I don't remember. If, I don't know if you remember the scene, but she she's in an airport and she's struggling to come out. And Laura Dern is there, and Laura Dern's playing the the out lesbian who she's yeah. trying to come out to, and and she kind of leans over on a counter and like gets in front of a microphone that she doesn't know is on and says, "I'm gay," and it's yeah. through the whole airport. And ooh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it's hard to it's hard to, it, it's a sitcom, but it's hard to. It's hard to talk about uh, but for the impact that it had on me um, at that time. I don't know why I just, there's a weird effect, <laughs> a weird effect happening on the Zoom right now. Um, but uh, uh, because there was nothing like that happening. That was one of the first like moments of representation, like broad representation. Um, you know, there, were, there was obviously cult queer media that, you know, I've gone back and grown to love now, but, but in terms of broadcast network television, you know, that just wasn't a thing that we right. got. Right. And, um, and so that was huge for me. And um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forgive the queer community for canceling Ellen. <laughs> That's, it's such a, it's such a, I mean, a, a, a vital moment in my life. And yes, like, whatever, people can be problematic and, and, and good at the same time. But for me, like, Ellen will always be a hero for that reason. Um, uh, I and then and then it, and much later on in life because I didn't meet um, queer, other queer people. I'm sure I did, but I didn't meet other out, out queer people or people who I knew were queer until really I was um, in my twenties um, uh, and had moved to to California and had started a church, a small church in California. I was a worship leader there and. And uh, we had a, a person show up at our congregation one day early on in the in the development of this new church, and and asked, "Is like, is, is this a safe place for me? I'm gay." And we became roommates. We became super good friends. Uh, he introduced me to a lot of other queer people, uh, including my my t still to this day best friend, whose name is Joshua, uh, who was just a vital part of of my coming out process in my twenties. I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't know what to say about that person other than I just am so thankful that God, the universe, whatever brought him into my life because uh, I, I don't know where I'd be without uh, mm -hmm. friends like that, right. like friends mm -hmm. like Joshua to, to help walk me through that process and make me feel normal for the first time in my life, you know, to see, to be able to sit down with someone and speak privately about all of the internal anxiety and turmoil and everything that I had carried for so long. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it was other queer people who saved me mm -hmm. and, um, and, 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 and like period, like that's kind of, <laughs> there's not much more to say about that. You know, I'm thankful for our allies, but, uh, but they weren't, they weren't the ones who reached in and pulled me out. Mm -hmm. and it was, it was queer folks. And I think queer folks have a unique power to, to save ourselves and save each other. That is so yeah. cool. That's so cool. And, and this is kind of kind of a part of a lot of things with healing and so on. When you can uh, say what you think, when you can say what you feel, 
when you can be who you are and you don't die, which yeah. for queer people, and by the way, thank you for letting us use that word because LGBTQ is hard for me to get out. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, when you can say that and, and you don't die and somebody affirms you and um, tells you in a sense it's okay to be who you are. Mm -hmm. That's a huge, that's a huge thing, you know, um, and religion doesn't let you be who you are. It's, mm -hmm. it's always trying to, to mold you into something else. Yeah. Even if you're gonna, do not, do not conform, but be transformed. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I, God I, loves you, but not, what is it? God, God uh, Loves you for who you are, but but loves you too much to let you stay that way, or whatever right. horrible yeah. phrase. I, I have <laughs> said that. I've said that. Oh, I said it too, baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We we all did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, you know, just that need to heal. I, I think all of us have that, and and it's especially, um, we have a friend. You talked about um, conversion therapy, and this friend was was a kid in our church. He was 10th grade or something like that mm -hmm. when he was in our church. And I assumed that he was gay, um, but we didn't ever talk Nobody about ever it. Nobody ever talked about we it. We didn't talk about it. And I, I regret that I didn't help him because he eventually went to conversion therapy and all of that. And it's interesting that line that he walked like you did where he said, okay, I must have a problem. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, he, he was for going to conversion therapy, just like you went to Exodus, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I, I admire your bravery, you know, to say, I don't think I'm wrong, but I'm going to try. And he went be above and beyond to try for them, um, which may have traumatized you more. <laughs> but uh, I admire your courage and your bravery. Mm -hmm. uh, to progress because you can hear it in your story mm -hmm. that 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 you progressed but even more mm -hmm. so to be to come out and be your authentic self i think that takes yeah more bravery really Th to that say. is where that is where the bravery began mm -hmm. yeah i would not i would no, there was no bravery in going to um uh conversion therapy that was all um the the that was that was the opposite of bravery that was the succumbing to the pressure to fit in and conform to the standards around me it was um it it, it wasn't i'm not going to say it was a weakness because it's just it was survival too at the same time it was like what i what i had to do to survive yeah. um thank you for but that. that's good yeah yeah it's it's uh it's i don't know that's that's an interesting thing to think about and a hard thing to classify off the top of my head what to call that drive um but uh I, I, no bravery was <laughs> when i finally mm -hmm. you know started to say to the people around me you know what i think some of this is bullshit i don't think i can change my orientation i've been at this for five years mm -hmm. and, and and i'm gay as ever <laughs> it's not working you know that those were the things that you know to the things that that, that were kind of the whispers in the back of my head that the voice within the intuition that I had been suppressing and ignoring and avoiding for so long, when I finally started to listen to her, then, then that was, you know, those were the first steps I think of courage. Um, yeah. And, you know, so much of evangelical Christianity, at least our experience, and maybe it was yours too, is to die to self, not listen oh, to yeah. self, not, not trust listen. Yourself. Yeah. Not trust yourself. And so I think that's kind of what leads us into doing things that are not authentic, you know, such mm -hmm. as going to conversion therapy or, you know, you name your thing that you're doing that is not authentically you. Um, and once we start listening to that intuition, that person inside us, that's when we can be our true authentic self. And yeah. that's, that's where the healing really, really starts. So I'm so and, glad and, you found that, you know, I really, <laughs> me too, me too. Yeah. Um, and, and, and aren't, aren't, isn't evangelicalism just the, the expert at, uh, uh, 
funneling us into these these paths that we're not meant for right. by by te by teaching us by using by by establishing a standard right the bible the scriptures the holy inerrant inspired infallible word of god uh, and we're trained to believe that from the youngest of age and so then the the that that bedrock of our faith is then used uh, and abused and misused against us um, with these, you know, the six clobber passages that we all know about by by this point, um, uh, and, and plenty of scholarly research has been done around that. We don't really need to go into it, but there, th th those verses get used um, to 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 yeah to to teach us that that this innate part of us. Um, this instinctual inborn piece of who we are uh is is actually not that right like it's not instinctual or inborn it's actually you know it's it's a flaw it's a deficiency of love from the same sex parent you know there's all all this stuff that was like heaped on us and then what to get back to what you were saying about the mistrust of ourselves we use verses like uh the heart is deceitful above all things who can understand it who can know it you know uh lean not on your own understanding uh so so then we're we're, we're that same bedrock of the faith the scriptures is then used to to get us to mistrust our, our own gut our own intuition our own bodies which are gifts yeah everything about us is a gift the, from our from our physical flesh to our psyche to our emotions to our soul it's all it's all it all works in concert to get us where we need to go and we're taught to mistrust all of it in different ways we're certainly taught to think to be ashamed of our bodies and then we're taught to not trust to listen to that intuition that voice inside it's lying to you girl is what they say you know it's going to deceive you it's going to take you down a bad path yeah. and uh and it's all so um uh, meticulously crafted in evangelicalism to to get us to conform uh to to stay part of this power structure and uh and and keep giving away our power to that structure and that system and um ooh, it is a it's a, a doozy to to extricate yourself from that it's hard 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 work right. and that's yeah. why there's that's why there's you know deconstruction is a buzzword now you know that's why we have these communities that have found each other you know, thanks to podcasts and thanks to the internet and things like this that that have helped us all see, oh, we were all being gaslit and we were kind of gaslighting each other without even knowing it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice to, to everybody. Yeah. To heterosexual, cisgender, you know. Everybody. And, and it seems like the church goes through a, what some people call a garage sale every 500 years or so. So there's, mm -hmm. there's the Reformation 500 years ago because mainly because of the printing press and now mainly because of the internet, probably where the information is not guarded. There's the gatekeepers can't keep it anymore. And so we all have it, but I'd like to, if we can switch gears a little bit and talk about your music a little bit. Um, so I have, about well, speaking of gatekeepers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about Christian music. <laughs> yeah. So oh. Beyonce is it is like um, storming country music, right? Yes, now. And that's did the right. Same thing. He did the same thing on the Christian charts with. Oh well, let's 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 not draw let's not draw any comparisons to Beyonce. There's <laughs> well, there there are uh, light years, you know, you know inf unfathomable light years between what she's doing. It's uh, the same type of thing in your. <laughs> you did the thing you were trying to, you know. That you may or may not have been trying to do, but it it um, a huge huge blast right there. Mm. Um, how how did you come up with the name Flamey Grant? Is obviously from Amy Grant, right? Or mm -hmm. yeah. how did you get to that? No, that's it. That's uh, I. My husband and I were watching RuPaul's Drag Race in bed one night, and I turned to him and I was like, "I don't have a drag name. Do you have a drag name?" And he was like, "Of course I do. It's Amanda. Do it." And I was like, well, I need a drag name. And so I, uh, uh, you know, just, I, I love the names that are, you know, the, the puns with, with your favorite diva. That's just right. like such a fun, fun thing for me. Shaka Convict and Tina Burner and uh, Delta Work, you know, those kinds of names are so fun for me. And I was like, but, you know, my diva growing up was Amy Grant. And so it just kind of like rolled off the tongue and he laughed, my husband laughed. And I, and he has, he was not raised in any of the stuff we're talking about. He has, he has his own trauma but not religious trauma you know he's, right. he's free from that world thankfully so i was like wow well okay if 
if my husband gets it and can laugh, then I know there's like a whole generation of church kids who will just, you know, eat that up. And um, so I, I uh, yeah, I just, I, like that night I went and I like, reserve you know reserved the handle on instagram the flamey grant and and it was months and months before i even did anything with it i i I had no ambitions to be a drag queen i just i was like that's just too good it's too good of a thing to pass up i'm gonna go grab it um i loved drag i was super interested in it uh uh especially you know the 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 further into my 30s i got i was kind of rediscovering that childhood impulse that had been squashed down inside me for so long um but you know like i I went out at halloween and drag and i went to a few house parties and it was just a fun thing and i was like yeah it's this is never going to be anything more than just a fun side hobby um and then pandemic happened Mm. and uh (laughs) and suddenly i had all the time in the world that i didn't have before and i chose to fill it with youtube makeup tutorials and hanging out in my bedroom and painting my face and uh and then eventually going on the internet uh as flamey grant um my I, i we my husband and i had we lived with two of our best friends at the time so we shared a house and they were musicians as well and so the three of us uh my not my husband was part of it but he's not a musician but the, really the four of us would put on a show every thursday night on facebook it was just like a cover concert we would come sing songs and drink and chat and um and uh i started showing up to those in drag and so like it just kind of grew it just kind of snowballed and the next thing i knew i was being asked to give a sermon at, at my church by the at this point i was at a very progressive uh you know inclusive affirming church in san diego so i was asked to give the sermon in drag uh and i was like well i don't know what that looks like um so i uh literally made a TikTok video a 60 second TikTok video one of those you know transition videos where like you start your makeup and then you cut oh, yeah. and you're, it's, it's a little more like that kind of thing and just giving a sermon, a 60 second sermon as I was getting into drag, literally just as a, a test run to see what does this even look like giving a sermon in drag? I've never seen that just done before. Um, and I, you know, posted it and I went to bed and the next morning I woke up and it was my first time ever going viral for anything. And, uh, and the comments in that thread that day changed changed my trajectory it was people just said over and over again this makes me feel so seen and Mm. so safe Mm. and and it just the light bulb went on for me that day and i was like oh my god this thing that i've been doing for myself which is really just inner inner child work it's just reconnecting with the kid right and telling that kid that all of those all those impulses are okay and all that shame like let let's let's yeah let's strip away that shame baby and let's like indulge and let's explore and let's be creative and all of that and uh uh, i realized that work i was doing for myself was something it was a gift that i could turn around and and re-gift right a gift gift to other people Mm -hmm. and um and so that's when flame grant really became like a a thing for me and 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 a, a something i started pursuing and from there it was just kind of a natural um move for me to incorporate music into my drag because i like I said, I wrote my first song when I was nine years old. I'd always been singing, always been writing. I'd been in a couple different bands. I'd done a solo thing and I was a worship leader. And um, so that's what I did. I just, you you bring yourself to the drag, right? Like you, you, drag can be anything. It's theater. Uh, so it can be literally anything, dance and movement and comedy and uh, drama and, and whatever. And for me, it's the music. I brought the music and the songwriting to my drag. And um and and it just kept snowballing from there suddenly a a a little five song ep that i thought i was going to record became a full album which became bible belt baby which you know got on on the 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 charts thanks to a weird uh you know little incident with a bully on the internet uh and 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 yeah the rest as they say (laughs) was her story you want to talk about that Sure. If you're, if you want to hear it, um, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's plenty of places people can go get kind of the full story. Um, uh, I it's in Rolling Stone, you know, which is a crazy thing to say, like who I I, I never imagined I would be able to say that go, go read my story in Rolling Stone. Um, but, uh, basically there's, there's a guy, uh, his name's Sean Foyt. He's a, 
self-described uh, MAGA, uh, yeah, MAGA worship leader. He's the guy who, is. yeah, he's the guy who was holding a bunch of unmasked uh, worship concerts yeah. at the height of pandemic. Yeah. That yeah. kind of thing. So he he he, he had built a name. little, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He built a little name for himself, um, and he. I, I became friends with another person, Derek Webb, who is a singer in the band Cayman's Call. Um, Derek and I sang on each other's records. We're, we're, we're very good friends now. Derek is the best human. I adore this man. Uh, everybody go check out Derek Webb. Um, and so I opened for Derek at his, his show in Nashville. We took some photos. Photos got out on the internet or whatever, and, and Sean Foyt got his hands on them and reposted it and said, look, this is what happens when we deconstruct our faith. Like, you got Christian musicians collaborating with drag queens. It's truly the, the end of days. Um, and, 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 and that just turned into a little thing. Derek was the one who actually nudged me and said, hey, you should uh, engage with this guy. He's got 100 million followers. Like, see if you can make some lemonade. <laughs> and so I did. I was just like, oh, no, end of days, babe. No, no, no. We're just getting started. That was my cheeky little retort with like a kissy face or whatever. And, uh, and he came, he wrote back, well, it's a good thing. No one cares about you or, or listens to what you do. And I was like, Oh, you just like, like you, you, you've, you've, let's what is fire. it drawn? The, you've drawn the battle lines. Like, let's, let's yeah. go. Like, let's, let's, let's do this thing. Uh, Cause you just challenged a drag queen. Uh, and so I went to, I went to my community, my social media community and said, look, I have a record. It's been out for 10 months. I have a song on that record called Good Day. Um, it features Derek Webb, mm -hmm. coincidentally. Um, so Derek and I are being attacked by this MAGA guy. Let's let's see if we can get Good Day to chart on the Christian charts to prove to prove him wrong, you know, to prove the, the idea that no one cares about um, a redemptive, inclusive uh, spiritual practice let's prove him wrong. And people ate it up. They were ready to do that. And I'm so thankful for the internet for TikTok because it, uh, it, it, it shot up the next day. I had the number one Christian record and si single and, um, on both the iTunes charts. Um, and that was, that was enough to grab some, some headlines and really change the trajectory of my life in a, in a significant way. Um, so now I do this full time and uh, I tour all over the country and get to sing my songs and about I'm about to put out my second record um, later this summer. And yeah, it's been a whirlwind since, since the <laughs> Sean Foyt came for me. So I'll forever be grateful to that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Curly haired uh, Seattle Sonics Jersey wearing worship leader uh, from California. Yeah. Thanks Sean. Yeah. I, yeah, he's a creep. I he really is. He, he you said up, it, not me. He, he makes up <laughs> he makes up stories. Yeah. True. And he's just my favorite. He's just my favorite is the story he made up about um how his guitar got stolen. Yeah, you know, exactly. have you, you know that one? Exactly. Yeah, his guitar his guitar got stolen out of their van. I can't remember where. But uh, so he, he, they, somebody on his team thinks that, you know, he knows who, who did it and they go and find this person, an unhoused person. And sure enough, the guy has, has the guitar and they, I think they buy it back or he pawned it. That's what happened. So they bought it back from the pawn shop or, um, or, or they paid the guy. I can't remember. But anyway, so they bring the, the, un the, the, the unsheltered person to Sean and they're like, like, let's, let's. Like, let's get him saved. Let's get him baptized. And um, the guy didn't want to do it. Like, they, there's an interview with with him later where he's like, no, I didn't want to do that. And he even says something like, uh, uh, well, he, I, I put all of this in a skit that I did. Uh, so this is why I know the story so well, but, um, or have forgotten parts of it. But uh, he, he said something like, well, oh, fuck. Okay, we'll go do it. Like, quote, you know, that, that's that was his like, attitude so he goes and gets baptized on stage with sean foyd at a concert so sean like gets to like say this whole story about oh like we saved the guy who stole my guitar but the guy meanwhile like a week later does an interview where he's like yeah that guy was weird and uh, they paid me money and i said fuck sure i'll do it so like right. sure a very a very sincere conversion sean yeah sean god says, is great hallelujah yeah sean <laughs> says god writes the best stories you know about this story that he 
that he, and then uh, and then Sean edits them. <laughs> right. So oh, anyway. Oh man. Hey, so I'm curious. Woody, I heard a reference to Woody Guthrie. No, somebody talking about you. Saying Woody Guthrie, it, it's on your one of your pages or something. Oh, there was a review. Yeah, oh, somebody. Yeah. Some, yeah, said that that my music was in the vein of Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie, I think, yeah. which which is what a what a what a high honor. What a, yeah, yeah. Wow. so I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, so that that resonates with me. You get close to my what I feel inside, what music speaks to me inside. Mm-hmm. Very mm. um, so yeah, you know, for for me, the mu- the music is um, like the whole reason Bible Belt Baby was we released it in the Christian category was, well, there were a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons was because when I finished it, I, I pulled back and I looked at it and I was like, this is, this is what I was listening to in the nineties at, at our Christian bookstore. You know, I was only allowed to listen to Christian music growing up, but I gravitated to the songwriters. I gravitated to the Jennifer Knapps and the Cabin's call and Margaret Becker and uh, you, you know, Stephen Curtis Chapman, you know, like people who wrote songs and told stories. And so that's, that's what I do with my own music. Um, and uh, and so I, I listened to it. And I was like, it's telling a spiritual journey. It might not be the it might not be the journey that they that Christian radio wants to tell, but it's my spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and 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 so it it belongs. It belongs in that space in Christian music. And so that's why we put it there. So uh, that wasn't a decision I I did lightly. You know, that was it took. I was like, I don't know if I want a Christian record. That's mm-hmm. yikes. Yeah. Um, but but Lord, I'm glad I did. <laughs> Do you, yeah. do you consider yourself a songwriter? And the reason I ask, because I, um, I have a high, high regard for what I call poets and prophets. You know, it's the same vein. You're trying to express something that's timeless, that's hard to explain. It's it's something you're trying to get out. And and songwriters, you know, and I'd also in that vein, I'd have to ask you if you're a Swifty. But she is a good songwriter, right? In my opinion, um, do uh, do you consider? I guess do you consider yourself a, a poet? Um, well, my my, you know, every drag queen has to have a good tagline, and mine is the shame slang, hip slang, singing songwriting drag queen. So yes, singing singer songwriter is a huge part of my my personal uh, artistic identity, my professional identity. It's it's how I see myself and. Uh, I was writing songs, like I said, long before drag. So it's very, very important to me. And I love song. I love the craft. I love, I love all of it. I love recording songs and then putting them out and then performing them. It's, it's my favorite thing. And, and, um, and I love that I'm able to take that and put all that into my drag. So yeah, the, the reason the Kerville Folk Festival uh, competition is, is in my bio is because that's, I, I'm so proud of that moment. I, I, especially in the early days, I, I kind of, my little inner saboteur question was, you know, people, are people just listening to the music because it's drag and like, like, is it, am I just flashy as a drag queen? And, and that's why mm-hmm. people are, are, are here or, or do, or do the songs resonate? Are the songs actually good? <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. You know, that's the question. Yeah. Like, like we all, we all have that question. Like, am I doing a good job basically? And so the, the Kerrville Folk Festival has a, a competition called the New Folk Songwriting Competition, and it's judged blind, at least initially. You submit songs, and the screeners who are listening to the songs only get the song title. They don't get any information about who wrote it. There's no picture, nothing. Is, your name isn't associated with it. They literally only have a song and a title. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that was a making it through that, that uh, to the, the 20, there's 24 finalists that get invited to the competition to perform and making it to that 24 was huge for me it, it it felt very validating it felt like okay like i'm here because i'm a good songwriter not because anybody even knew i was a drag queen mm-hmm. um, uh, although the, the some of the lyrics and some of the songs might have tipped them off if they really really like put two and two together but yeah. yeah but um uh yeah so and then and then you know i i did perform in drag at the actual festival so they did know by then but um yeah, I, I love the craft and I, it's, it's my first love. Uh, mm-hmm. Drag is, you know, honestly, honestly, secondary to songwriting. If, 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 if I ever, you know, stopped doing drag, I don't think I would stop doing, mm-hmm. uh, stop writing songs. Um, mm-hmm. Not that I have any intention of stopping drag either. I still, I still love it. I love yeah. it very yeah. much. That's cool. Um, 
So I have a question, but like, I always, I'm always apprehensive to ask this question because if it's, if it's too personal of a question, you can tell me that. Um, yeah. You know, and I, and I will, don't worry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I've got no okay. qualms. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we've been talking about <clears throat> religion, deconstruction. So these days, how would you describe your relationship with religion? Yeah, this is a lovely question. And I think an important one. Um, I love what Derek Webb says about the the word Christian, which is that if it's used in any context other than describing a person, if it's describing anything other than a person, it's just a marketing term. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I have no, I, I, I love that. I, I, I have no qualms about you know, saying I'm a Christian musician and I'm a Christian artist and I, I put out Christian music uh, because I do. It's it's right there on iTunes. If you pull up the Christian category, you'll find my record. So, um, uh, so that's that's kind of the may, maybe and and to some people probably a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just a, a pass, an easy you know I'll work around or I'll, it's you know you're not you're not sincere then you're not a sincere Christian and. Um, and that's also a fair criticism uh, because at the end of the day, I probably am a universalist. I probably am uh, someone who believes that uh, God so loved the world period. You know, like um, if, if, if there is a God, as we understand that term, right? Like I, 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 I don't basically, I don't subscribe to belief anymore. And belief is the thing that was so important growing up right you had to you had to have your checklist you had to mm -hmm. believe the creed you had to believe all the right things in order to be in and so we did we would profess our creed on a regular basis and um and that was what re retained our membership in the club it's how it's how we stayed in and um but for me belief is not a helpful thing uh and and i'm, I'm not saying that that's not a universal experience. Obviously that's my experience. Belief isn't helpful to me because it is um, not, uh, not a, um, what is the easiest way for me to explain this? I, I it, it's, it's belief by definition isn't true, right? Something that's true can be proven. It can be known by all people. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's a true thing at all times for yeah. all people kind of thing like it's it's a fact right so belief isn't fact it isn't true and that's why we have to call it belief because it's something we hope for it's the evidence of things unseen it's it's faith you know it's um we have to use these words because it's unseen it's unknowable it's unprovable right the afterlife we can't we can't know right. god we can't know we can't right. know god mm -hmm. like there's nothing not in not in the sense that that uh that we know that, you know, this computer I'm talking on is, is right here and functioning and, and that you and I are in real, in real time communicating. Um, uh, th those things are at best um, hopes that, that we, we put our trust in, we, we put our faith in. And, and so for me, I haven't found that to be a helpful part of my journey and my growth and bec and becoming a whole happy human. Um, what I have found to be helpful are practices, spiritual practices, um, which could include everything from meditation to yoga to um, uh, just the, the, what we used to call fellowship, you know, like human connection, right. um, uh, those sorts of things. Like I, 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 I find myself engaging in spiritual practice rather than espousing spiritual beliefs. That's kind of where I'm at. And the Christian piece to it, I, I haven't just chucked it because um, to me, it's cultural more than anything. Yeah. You know, it's in my bones. I, I was, where you I, came from. Was, yeah, it's where I came from. It's, it's my heritage. It's um, my, uh, it, yeah, it's. It, I'll never get that out of my system. I'll never forget those old hymns I grew up singing. I'll. I'll. I. I. I don't even know how many Bible verses I've quoted in this conversation, but it's in there. You know, like yeah. it's mm -hmm. just, it's in there. And so, 
you know, I, I, I don't, I don't feel the need to, to chuck it all just because I may not believe in a literal resurrection or, or, a, or sub, penal substitutionary atonement anymore. Um, I don't think those things are requirements for uh, Christianity at all. I think so much of what we call Christianity in America today was never envisioned by yeah. Jesus, by the Christ. Uh, it was not part of the Christ's plan at all. And, and um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's as subjective as anything else. And um, so I don't your, need you know, love your neighbor and the golden rule and don't hurt people. And, and these, those would be very these, helpful. Yeah. Uh, like you these said, are Jesus. Practice, Jesus didn't. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, Jesus didn't start the religion. He, he did, you know, at least echo somebody else say, love your neighbor, mm-hmm. care for people, wash their feet. Don't, don't harm yeah. people. Don't do things to people that you don't want them to do to you. And yeah. things like that. Those yeah. are things to hang on to. And I find myself speaking to my old people, you know, directly or indirectly. Sometimes some of that needs to come out, I think. Mm-hmm. That we need to voice that and, and say, mm-hmm. this hurt me. This, this didn't help me. This held me back uh, and so on. But anyway, I interrupted mm-hmm. you. Yeah. Sorry. No, I, we were, we were, both talking it's fine um i uh this is just becoming like the derek webb masterclass at this point but uh, another thing another phrase i love from derek is he says god doesn't get everything in the divorce and i love that so much because exactly what you're talking about like those are universal truths um jesus didn't own the golden rule he articulated it well or or whoever wrote the 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 gospels you know uh put put it put it in his mouth really in in a lovely way but um that's that's a universal experience that 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 loving others and loving ourselves uh leads to health and happiness um and my favorite bible verse is is uh, micah 6 8 which is is you know do justly love mercy and walk humbly with your god Mm -hmm. um and I, 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 yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ditch that. That's, that's a, that's a life principle for me. Mm. I want to, I want to love justice. I want to love it so much that I chase it down and advocate for it for other people. I want to be humble. I, I want to walk humbly with my God. I don't want to foist my God on everyone else. But if, if I, if I have a spiritual connection to the divine, I want to be humble about it. And yeah, I want to love mercy. I want to love it so much that I just want everybody to be free. Mm. Um, so those, those are, yeah. God doesn't get everything in the divorce. The the evangelical church doesn't get every doesn't get to keep everything when I divorce them. Um, yeah, it's uh, that's 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 part of our yeah. what we retain. Yeah, we're gonna go to our first Pride Parade in June. Where are y'all located? Where are you going? Kansas City. We're gonna go to Kansas City. Although they oh, Kansas City have one a little closest closer to us in St. Joseph, Missouri. So maybe we'll hit. Oh, that's, we're fairly close to Omaha. Mm-hmm. Nothing made. Fantastic. Nothing made, but um, the question I want to ask is not just about the pride parade, but how can, what, what is your advice for advocates? Um, how can we, what's the best way for people like Laura and I, I look back at that cultivated ignorance that I had, and I'm sorry about it. Um, but I'm also trying to learn. Um, I'm also um, trying to have conversations with people. Um, but what, sh- what should I be doing? What, what should we be doing that would help the most? Well, and if I can, yeah. if I can um, just like piggy tail on that too, I'm also an elementary school teacher. And I want to know, like, because I teach, I've taught first grade, second grade, third grade. And I have no doubt that there are little ones that come through my door that were like your nine-year-old self. And so I want to know, I mean, just to kind of go along with that, how can I be an, an advocate, a champion for them as well as, mm. their, you know, as their teacher, someone who, um, I mean, my big thing is inclusivity. Um, yep. but I also recognize that, you know, I'm not as inclusive as I could be, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Like if that makes mm-hmm. sense to you. So yeah. I, just, I guess maybe we can tie those two together in some way. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, things can change so pretty dramatically based on individual specific cases and like sure. the people, the people you're dealing with. But in general, I, I think that you can't go wrong if you provide space for celebration. I think back to me walking into the, the living room in, in, in those heels and my mom's nightgown and I'm, I'm beaming in this photo. I'm such a happy kid. Uh, and so I know that there must have been a spirit of celebration in the room at that moment because everybody's, you know, and, and laughter and, oh my gosh, look at how funny, um, you know, this kid's being. And, uh, and very quickly that, that was taken from me, you know, very, very quickly. I, I, the things that brought me life weren't celebrated anymore. Yeah. And we're, in, and we're in fact shamed. So it's not just a, it's not a neutral stance. It's not a tolerance stance. It's a celebration. Like if a kid is beaming and, and, and bringing you a piece of themselves, whether that's art they've made or whatever a story they want to tell, or just a behavior that they embody, celebrate it, you know, make space for it. And, um, and, and don't let, don't let shame get a foothold. Uh, it, it will, you know, we all, like this sure. is just the human this is the human experience but um there are levels to to, to shame right and so we we want to like not let it let, let it get that foothold early on um I, and i think that goes for adults too you know that, that's what that's what pride is pride is a celebration and and it's needed still because shame is so profound in our world and so we have to we have to it's part of the dismantling of shame in our, in our lives and in our psyches and our emotional beings is mm -hmm. to choose to celebrate the things that the world has shamed us for. Um, our bodies, our, our mannerisms, our behaviors, our, who we love, um, all of that. Uh, another thing I would say is, you know, probably more often than not, it's, uh, it's getting out of the way. Of, of queer people um because as I, as i said before you know i was saved by queer folks i was saved pretty exclusively mm -hmm. by queer people who who showed me the path and, and made space for me and gave me the way um that doesn't mean that you know allies uh, and accomplices aren't capable of doing the same thing you absolutely are um but I don't know. I think in general, if there's, if there's, uh, some, someone who can do that work, who is a queer person, like help amplify their voice, help spotlight them, mm -hmm. help, um, point other people to them and, and then champion them, you know, champion that work. Um, whether that's, you know, just with your, your time and energy attending, whatever it is they're doing, sh talking about it, posting about it, uh, Queer people need your financial support. Like queer, queer uh, healers and artists and teachers uh, need need to make a living as well. Um, so these are all all ways to um, ensure the not just the survival but the sur thrival of <laughs> of um, you know uh, queer identities. And and then um, all that said, that doesn't mean that there's not a place for you to also use your voice as an ally and an accomplice. And and those those opportunities, I think you, 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 you know them when they come to you, you know, you see someone saying something that shouldn't be said in public or, uh, or denigrating a queer person and you, and you stand in the gap and you get in between and you, 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 you put your body on the line for, for other people, um, and use your voice for other people. And I think that those, um, we need allies who are willing to, to, um, we need accomplices, you know, we need people who are uh, passionate about, about the work of inclusion and equality and diversity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a spectrum of ways uh, to, yeah. to get involved. I like yeah. the, that you use the word celebration. Uh, again, you kind of touched on a universal thing, which is good. And because after, after a lifetime of religious mm -hmm. stuff and trauma, uh, a, a woman asked me one time, Carl, do you know how to celebrate? 
And I said, I don't think, <laughs> I, do. I, don't think I do. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm in therapy again, <laughs> working through some of that to say, mm. how can I celebrate? And, and, in that the uh, you said it so beautifully, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna reiterate it because um, I'm mm -hmm. just gonna go back and listen to what you said later. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And Laura yeah. has one final thing. Okay, so where can we find you? Where can we find your amazing work? Just tell us all the places. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for for giving for for doing exactly what I just talked about, right? And spotlighting uh, me. Thank you for giving me a little bit of a, a spotlight right now. I appreciate it. Um, and before I do, uh, you know, Carl, let me just say, I'm so glad y'all are going to Pride, uh, because that is a, a space to celebrate and you will be also celebrated as an ally. That's um, there's 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 nothing like pride, and I'm so glad uh, that y'all are going to your first. And there's nothing like your first pride. Um, uh, I I just hope you have the best time, and and so Kansas yeah. City show show these two a good time is what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm um, so jealous because my granddaughters who are uh, well last year what were they they were uh, five and two they've already been to their first their pride second parade. One. This they're, is their second one. They're veterans. <laughs> they, they got you beat. That's right. And I'm glad. I love it. But you know what? It's never too late. And, and that's, that's the point of all of this. Like I didn't start doing drag until I was 37. Um, and look what happened. So yeah, yeah. I'll always, uh, it's never too late to, to listen to that intuition that we've that's been right. for so long. That's right. Um, I'm at flamey, I'm at flameygrant.com. That's the first place to just kind of get a, a sense of what my tour schedule is, um, where to, what my social media is all linked on there. Uh, and then my music, you can find my music in, in all the places you expect to. So Spotify, Apple music, Amazon, um, YouTube, um, whatever your, your digital drug of choice is you can find, find my music. And, uh, yeah, I'm touring, I'm touring all year really. Uh, but especially this summer, especially during pride month, I'll be kind of in the Midwest a lot. Um, and then up in new England later in the month. And then I'll, I'm actually going to be in the UK, uh, for about a month later in the summer. And then this fall, it hasn't been announced yet, but I'm, I'm working on a, a fall tour to support the new record that will be national. Hopefully, uh, if we can, if we can lock in all these venues we're chasing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of all over the country and, and even in other parts of the world uh, this year. And uh, so come That's see so me, exciting. come see me at a show. Cause the show, yeah. I mean, I, I love, I love making a record. I love recording an album, but the shows are where so much of the magic happens. And um, so if you can get out to a show, I'd love to meet you. Well, I, we would love that. And if you are ever like, I don't know, we'll have to, we'll have to keep tabs on your, all your tour dates so that if you're yeah. in our general vicinity, I mean, we, we're willing to travel and you know two three hours but we would love to come see you in person yeah i think I, I, when when those fall dates get announced i think you'll you'll see a uh, okay. something r real close to you <laughs> yay cool. yay Great. okay thank you so much for being on the podcast for making time to thank you share your life with us it's been so great to talk to you it's a it's an honor to get to do it and uh to meet great people like y'all so thank you so much for what you're doing you. Yeah, absolutely for all the listeners out there we thank you for tuning in we appreciate you uh being with us uh participating listening to the stories and contributing and as always be where you are be who you are and be at peace thank you for joining us today on the desert sanctuary podcast remember all who wander in the desert are not lost we believe all of our stories are sacred we are always here if you need someone to hear your story. Check out our blog on Pathios and also our YouTube channel. And stay tuned for our Leaning Forward Conference. Remember, we love you. And be at peace.